Hey, thanks for tuning in. Carm Capriato here. Now, we're going to talk about incentive pay. You will conclude from this episode, I believe, that there is no silver bullet on this topic. There are a lot of moving parts to create compensation plans unique to your business culture for the results you, your employees, and team need to have to best serve your customer and to create financial rewards. Hey, I want to thank you if you've taken my short four-minute or less survey to help me know how we're doing. And what can we do to make the podcast better? Always better. Now go to remarkableresults.biz slash survey or find the link on the website or in your insider emails. Hey, look, now more than ever, you're focused on bringing cars through your bays safely and efficiently, right? Well, Shopware's shop management system offers a completely contactless workflow. Your customers can review, approve, and even pay for the repairs right from their smartphone or personal device. Now, please reach out for a demo. See them in action at getshopware.com slash carm shopware a great supporter of the town hall academy and a shout out to shop marketing pros i want you to think about how you deliver on your promises your customers want you to do what you say you're going to do right well it should be the same with your marketing company shop marketing pros listens cares and responds quickly and they do what they say they'll do for you on the web at shopmarketingpros.com. Hey, I invited a great panel, a great panel to discuss incentive pay. With me is Seth Thorson from Eurotech Auto Service based in New Brighton, Minnesota, and also owner of LMV Bavarian, a BMW tech support company. Brian Kelly is here from Valley Auto Electric, Covington, Washington, who's the chairman of ASA Northwest, and Bill Haas, Haas Performance Consulting, to get a coach's perspective. You may just put this episode on repeat. Because it contains a lot you'll want to review. We as owners have to recognize the person. And, you know, you hate to say this, but you you go back into that culture again. If your business culture accepts that, it will continue. And if if your business culture does not accept that, it will eradicate itself. Hey, more like this in a minute. Now, the detailed key talking points can be found for this episode at remarkableresults.biz slash A191, along with Brian's chart on 23 motivators of people. Remember, you can use the talking points to help create your own plan or meeting agenda. Hey, I'm so glad you're tuning in for the best aftermarket talk radio that I know will give you the insights that are going to help you grow personally and to help your business excel. Now, if you're not tuned in while you're mobile, Go to RemarkableResults.biz slash subscribe to get a free podcast app and find so many great features on my website. Have you visited the website lately? Like the books page, the keywords page, and Aftermarket Weekly Live. Go to RemarkableResults.biz. And I hope you've watched the only live shop tour in the aftermarket. It happens each week on Tuesday at noon Eastern time. You can watch on AftermarketWeekly.com or on Aftermarket Weekly's Facebook page, among so many other outlets. You get a ton of information and a shop tour each and every week. How about that? Now, an enlightening discussion on incentive pay. It is Town Hall Academy 191. Oh, look at this great panel that I have. And I hope you did tune in to hear us talk about incentive pay and never before, well, never before, but, you know, it's a, it's a critical component of pay programs in our industry today. And I want to thank you for being here, our 191st week of continuous aftermarket uh, learning, if you will. It's a single subject forum, and we do it here every week. Well, guys, thanks for being here. Who do I have? Seth Thorson. Everyone knows you, Seth. You're an important guy, a big influencer in our industry from Eurotech Auto Service, New Brighton, Minnesota, and LMV Bavarian. If you worked on a BMW and you ever needed help, you probably uh, went to LMV Bavarian. I can't say that ever. Really, I can't. (laughs) Tongue twister. BMW support company and uh, and and congrats on uh, you, you just put uh, a shovel in the ground for a brand new place right yep that'll be our third location so our third location will open in June when it's open you know I do the show every Tuesday after marketweekly.com and we do a shop tour we would love to be able to have a grand opening tour 
Yeah, I almost did the podcast from out there today um, in a private garage. We're going to be servicing out there, but there's a lot of Ferrari and a whole bunch of other cars in that garage. I almost did the podcast from there. Yeah, that would be so cool. By the way, next Tuesday, I'm doing my first live show for aftermarketweekly.com, a friend's place about 20 miles away, and, and I'm going to actually be, be from a, a, one of his bays, actually a standalone garage that he works on classic cars. I have no idea what's going to be in there. But there was an old uh, Chevelle in there when I, I stopped out to see him last week. So, uh, cool. So, uh, thank you very much. Brian Kelly is with us, Valley Auto Electric, Covington, Washington. How you doing, Brian? Hey, doing well. Thanks for having me, Carl. Thanks, man. Hey, ASA, very important to you in your life. Uh, last time I knew that you were chairman, what are you doing now for ASA Northwest? I'm still chair. Still, still chair. Uh, Yep, Chairman for ASA Northwest. Congratulations. Thank you so much. Appreciate that. And Bill Haas is with us from Haas Performance Consulting and also the business manager of NACAT, the North American Automotive Teachers Group. Bill, thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. Incentives, guys. Here's what I hope I hope we cover. Uh, having, having your people have an owner mentality, accountability to your strategic plans, a motivated team, rewarding behaviors, and everyone shares when milestones and goals are made. Also, what about training incentive, ASC incentive? Uh, what about hours produced? And uh, hmm, how about service advisor call conversions? And again, I know those may be certain particular goals, but I don't think it's bad if we look for incentive pay around that. And I think the whole thing is about having an owner mentality. Hey, thanks for being on my team. Make decisions like I do, and also I want to reward you for for making them. So, Bill, I want to go to you with the first question. Never be afraid, you told me, to pay an employee what they think they're worth. Yeah, I think that's really true. And, you know, unfortunately, I hear a lot from shop owners that will be talking to a potential hire, and they'll go, well, there's just no way I can afford this person. They're probably exactly what I need, but I can't afford to pay them. And that's the absolutely wrong way to approach this. You have to look at what does that person feel that they're worth and make sure you have a way to afford them, be able to reward them for that performance, make sure they're getting what they need to earn. The bottom line is this. If a shop doesn't think they can afford somebody, what they've really told me is they're not charging enough. You got to do the math backwards. Work the math backwards and figure out if I'm going to pay this person this much money, this is the the revenue that they need to generate in order for me to pay them and have the profit that my company desires and deserves. You know, Seth, I brought Bill on because he's got a coach's perspective, having so many clients. And, you know, I know we're going to hear a lot of what Bill uh, helps his, his customers with. Have you heard anything yet that you disagree with? No, I mean, for the most part, I mean, there there are times employees think they're worth way more than they are, and, and you just, it's not a good fit when you're interviewing and you can't pay them what they want. Or as a growing company, there are times when you're starting that growth stage or where you're a new company that it is hard to pay that top tier employee because you haven't established yourself. I think, as Bill said, you probably can charge enough to do it. Some people are afraid to. But for the most part, I mean, I got pay plans that will pay service writers 80 grand a year if they hit all their numbers. Now I got one service writer that he wanted 80 grand. I'm like, I want to make 80 grand. I'm like, great, here's your pay plan. You can do it. Halfway through the year, he's at 50 grand because he hasn't hit his numbers. And we just constantly go back and forth and go, look, if you, if you just push parts margin 2% more, then there's more money for you. There's more money for the tax. There's more money for everybody. But the power's in your hands. We build pay plans that put the power in the employee's hands. You just brought up something that's huge, and I and I think we all need to stop for a moment and, and let it resonate with us. I want to make 80, and you say, great. Well, here's your plan to get there. And halfway through the year, they're not there. Does the person lose their air out of the balloon? Can you help them realize that they've got an $80,000 pay plan, but they haven't accomplished it? And don't you see why this incentive plan exists for you? Because you have to make me money in order for me to give you the 80. Well, and it's not just a pay plan though either, Carm. It's having all the measurables that give you the ability to show them, here's the opportunity you have the opportunity to make $80,000. When they're not making $80,000 or the, at some point through the year, you don't see that they're going to hit that. 
you have to have all the other things in place in terms of measurables to look at how well they do on on the phone, how they they do in convert converting calls to appointments. What's their hours per repay order? What's their here's the biggest one that we miss so much is people fail to, to track lost sales. And until you start to track lost sales, you'll never understand what the real potential is in this store. And once uh, you understand what happens in lost sales, then you can do some other things that help them with sales training and that kind of thing that will get them closer to achieving that goal that they're hoping to arrive at. I so would I, say, Bill, though, with lost sales, one of the things we fail to do we, we fail to track lost sales as a most part, but we track it. But one thing we fail to do is track average written repair order per technician. I want to know how much my technician's writing up. My technician's not doing a thorough, proper inspection. I'm not even giving my sales guy a chance. That's correct. So that's why we have to have all those measurables. We can't point to just one thing, right? It's We have to have all those things in place. And they all got to be tied together. I take incentivized pay, I guess, from even a little bit different angle. And, and I look at it as, you know, what is it, what is it we're trying to motivate from our employees? You know, I've heard us all talk about cash and, you know, we've talked about money. We've talked about $80,000. We've talked about paying them what they're worth. Now, I think in any business scenario, they should be getting paid what they're worth. Now, in order to do that, there may be certain obstacles that they have to overcome. There may be certain things that they have to do, but I feel like we're basing this on the assumption that everybody's money motivated. And I think that as owners, we make that error all too often. And, and when in reality, there are so many other motivators for people, whether it's time off, whether it's praise, whether it is teamwork, ownership, those are true motivators. The dollars in many cases get them there. And, and if all we focus on is that, we're, we're losing the second half. And and really, we're, we're robbing in many ways from, from where these employees are, and we're doing nothing more than dangling a stick and a carrot in front of them. And I, I think that that's why so many employees leave. And I think that's where you see the high turnover is because somebody offered a bigger carrot. So when we talk about incentive pay plans, how do we get somebody where they need to be with incentive to grow? And also at the same time, how do we look at this and have a pay plan that we know the purpose of before we start. And it fits the culture of our environment and it fits the team that we wanna grow. And I think those are some really critical pieces. So it's not, it's not just about the pay, albeit the pay's gotta be there and there has to be a metric to get there. But if we wanna study KPIs, is that really what our incentive pay plan is about? Well, Brian, you bring up a good point. And those things that you're talking about that the employee feels good about the culture and environment that we've created, and they have to be praised. They have to be reminded that they're appreciated and that they're doing a good job. Though, And I can't do that just simply from a monetary aspect. You're absolutely right. But that's what a good leader does. A, a good leader is doing all those things so that that employee is willing to work harder at achieving the goals that have been set for them. If nobody feels appreciated or they don't feel that their job is important, then it won't matter what the goals are because they're not going to perform. That's a big part of it. I mean, the, the conversation went one way, but Brian took it another way. and <laughs> That's fine. But, you know, all that's important. You can't, the culture needs to be there before the pay plan to some degree. I'm notorious for beating guys up in other groups about vacation time. My industry is atrociously bad. Um, and we lose a lot of people due to that. So, I mean, I, you know, we, we give guys two weeks up front and I got some guys with four weeks vacation time. So, I mean, you know, we have a whole bunch of challenges in the industry from a benefit side that we don't provide. Hey, Carm here. Now listen when Brian warns about motivating your people through pay plan or dollars. Now he says it's just manipulation. It's as easy as one, two, three. Shopware's shop management system allows customers to review, approve, and pay for repairs all in one place. Now, one, your customer views their outstanding balance. Number two, they are prompted to submit payment directly through their invoice. And three, Shopware's secure portal facilitates payments right there without having to open another browser or remember another password. It's really that simple. 
Shopware is your complete solution for contactless service. Let remote pay work for you and improve your customer experience. Get started today. Visit GetShopware.com for more information and to request a demo. Hey, Carm here. Are your competitors ranking higher than you in search? Is your marketing company using plain vanilla recycled content? And does your marketing look like every other shop's and you're not even sure it's working? Powerful, effective marketing is not cookie cutter. It should showcase all of the things that are unique about your business. Don't you think you deserve better results? It's time to make a change. Our good friends at Shop Marketing Pros are past shop owners and industry veterans. They get it. Their process is pretty simple. Listen, create, and do. They spend time getting to know you and create a unique marketing message and then do the heavy lifting for you so you can do what you do best. Run a shop and fix cars. Do yourself a favor. Give your shop the top-notch marketing it deserves. Schedule a call today on the web at shopmarketingpros.com. That's shopmarketingpros.com. Don't wait. Do it now. Bill mentions leadership. Brian says it's really up to, you know, that that one-on-one. And I look at it as a blended program. You could literally sit down with your person knowing the affordability factor of performance. But you also want to say, hey, you know, like like Seth said, this guy wants the three-week vacation program. The thing that I worry about is that, that you know, listen, I got to have four weeks off. Here are the reasons. But you normally have a 14 to 16 day PTO program, personal time off in your company. Can you really have programs that are different per team member? Depends on your state. Some states you can't. Management can be different than hourly, but there are some very laws. You have to, there's ways around things, but you have to be careful. You have to be very careful. You better understand the rules for where you conduct your business. Um, but, you know, that whole thing about vacation, and I think that's important one, because here's what you're seeing a lot today is there's a lot of stores that need to need to hire people. The demand is huge. And so the people that you're finding today that you really want to hire have been somewhere else for an extended period of time, and they have a pretty good benefits package. They're not going to make that change. They're not going to move to your company unless that benefit package is comparable. And we're fighting this all the time. And, you know, I've got shops that are saying to me, oh, man, the guy's got three weeks vacation. There's no way I could give him three weeks vacation. Sure can. Well, that's the wrong answer. The answer is let's figure out how we're going to give them three weeks vacation. So, well, if you, know, you, if you give them what they want, they're going to be happy and they're going to want to work for you. And I, right. I think that's a critical piece. And, you know, we mentioned different pay for for, you know, similar positions. And, you know, I know in Washington state, I know you can definitely do that. You know, so if you have a incentivized plan for one person, it can be different than somebody else can be different than somebody else. You know, is it like that in all 50 states? I doubt it. But tailoring each plan to each person, I think is, is critical. You know, not, not everybody wants the same thing. And how do you incentivize the entirety of a team with the same incentivization? And, and I think that's the critical piece. Then here's our vacation plan for the entire team. If you're hiring a person, you say, I can't do four weeks, but I can do three and you could earn up to three and you could, you can say, you don't have to be here all these years in order to earn three. I'm going to give them to you. That's fine. And, but you need to come up with the list of what's really important. That's non-compensation for my people. And how can I make all of that work in a package and then tie the compensation incentives, which I, we need to talk about. In fact, I recently did some work on the invisible, invisible paycheck. So many team members don't even know what we really pay and what the value of vacations are and all the unemployment taxes and all the FICA that we pay. And and frankly, it's not like you're, you're forcing, you need to see, no, this is what it really takes to run a business and to pay our people. And I think an invisible paycheck, no matter if you're contributing to a 401k, it needs to be reminded of our people. Our employee portal that we have actually shows an employee's total compensation package with their 401k medical and dental. And that's where they log in to make all their benefits and time off requests and everything like that. 
And it's actually a pie chart that shows them total compensation package right in front of their face every time they log in. Well, and, and they have to have that because if they're ever going to think about leaving or thinking that, you know, there's a, another job, the grass is greener over here, they better be looking at all of that than just a single number of $25 an hour versus $26 an hour. They need to have all that information that you're talking about, Seth. But I want to back up for a second on the vacation thing. So there's another way to solve this problem. If I can't give somebody three weeks vacation because it's policy and there's some regulations that prevent it, what I'm going to do is I'm going to find a way to pay this person enough money that they can take a week off without pay. That was going to be my response. That's how you do it. You, you make sure the pay is commensurate with that extra week. Absolutely. And, and maybe you hold it back until that extra week and, and they get paid that, you know, and it's a, a separate account. But there's nothing wrong with that. And and that's working with the individuals to build a team. And and yeah. I think I think so many times as owners, we lock ourselves in a box. We assume that we can't do X or we can only do Y. And then we go out and search for that, that silver bullet to fix whatever problem we have around. And so often these incentivized pay plans become that silver bullet. We have to be careful. I, I love it. Silver bullet. I, I, I was thinking silver idea. I got to hire this guy and he needs an extra week of vacation. And you force yourself to break that box, to jump outside of it. I guarantee you, if you have found even a potential internal candidate someday to buy your business, you'll do anything you can within the scope of the law, within the fairness and non-discriminatory for your team, you'll figure it out. I mean, that's the built beautiful example of a creative idea. Just make the pay work so they can take a week without pay. If I sprinkle in, you know, training, our incentives, ASE incentives, hours produced, you know, my point to, you know, we kind of kind of got off on a tangent, but let's try to bring some how stuff to our listener. And what about, you know, when we're talking about incentives or things that we add, and I, I think one of those things that uh, is critical too, um, and we and we do it here, is we provide a tool stipend for the employees. You know, how do you how do you add that into an incentive package as well? Because now you have a mutually beneficial. We have all built in boxes. I can't imagine what that new shop's going to look like with all of your creative ideas. And so, Seth, the thing I would ask you on that and one of the reasons we don't provide all tools is we try and leave some autonomy in each in each person's hands so that they're able they're not working out of prescribed box. They're no, no, no. We provide, we provide the need. box. They provide their own hand tool. Yes. Okay. So you provide like, the box. Yeah, you're seeing exactly. Lexus, you're seeing Toyota, you're seeing BMW, you're seeing a lot of the OEMs provide built-in toolboxes, require it to their dealerships. So if you're trying to hire a technician and grow or do things, you're often finding techs that don't have toolboxes. So we limit a lot of technicians' growth because they can't even, they feel they're trapped. They can't look for a job because I have to go buy a toolbox and go work for this guy. That That's not happening. No, well, a lot of shop owners would go, I'll buy you a box if you come work for me. But the yeah, but there's, that. there's another issue with the whole toolbox thing too. It's, it's the technician who's got the semi trailer size toolbox that rolls into your shop and now restricts workflow and creates, you know, creates some other difficulties in the, in the shop. So that stuff you know, has to be addressed too. But, you know, that's really getting off track. To go back to, you know, where CARB started with this thing, in, in the pay program that we use in our company, we have pay enhancements. And so those pay enhancements, we can customize for every employee. And we have them for technicians, we have them for service advisors. So those pay enhancements will be things where we'll pay additional dollars on their hourly rate for continuing education. They have to meet a goal. When they meet that goal, and it's a quarterly goal, for the next quarter, they're earning additional dollars for every hour that they work for their continuing education. We'll do the same thing for ASC certifications or if there's a a smog license in some states, that kind of thing. We'll pay additional money. We'll place a value on each of those certifications. And so now we're encouraging them to not only get certified, but remain certified. So now that tech who at the end of five years needs to recertify and goes, ah, that's not important. All of a sudden he looks at his paycheck and he goes, 
well, it's worth a dollar eighty an hour if we're set up if we have them set up at at twenty cents a piece, and they've got nine certs. That's a dollar eighty an hour. The guy goes, hmm. I don't think I'm going to give that up. And pretty soon when you do the math and you start thinking about the average employee works about 2,100 hours a year, 2,100 hours a year at $1.80. Nearly four grand. That's some money. The biggest thing with that, and I agree with Bill, is we build our pay plans to accomplish the goals that we want. You know how much money you can maximum pay in that position at say 70% production at 80% production, 110% production. So you build your pay plans, hit those numbers, no matter what it is, backwards math. And then you need to build your incentives to accomplish what you want. If you believe in ASCs, then you build your pay plan to make sure that they maintain those ASCs. If you believe in training, you build your pay plan to reward that training. So the pay plans are built to make sure that you hit those goals. In my company, we have a, such a strong culture of training and some of the stuff that my incentives aren't based on those, but we have a different culture in our company. And some companies, we have a different way. We have other things we're looking for that we build our pay plan for incentives. But if those are truly important, and you can't get your guys to do it, then put them in the pay plan, build the pay plan to get what you want done. I think it's critical to remember whatever you focus on in the pay plan, they're going to value. Whatever you don't focus on, there's a real good chance they won't value it. And, and it doesn't matter if that's at the technician level or the service advisor level. And exactly like you said, Seth, you're going to tie some things into culture and, and that's going to be just prevent all the way through your, your, your business or other things you're going to tie into pay plan. But it's critical to understand what you're tying in and what it is they're not going to, you know, what it is they're not going to be incentivized on because sometimes that's more important than what they're incentivized on. Guys, let me ask a question about back of shop and counter. Do the uh, pay plans or the incentive plans have to be aligned between the technician and the counter? So in our system, we set production hour goals for every technician. And it's not across the board kind of a thing. We do it on an individual basis so that we look at their knowledge, their experience, and their skill sets. And based on that criteria, we determine how many hours we need produced by that technician. That's their goal. And then their production bonus is based on hitting that goal. And the goal is tiered. So they have opportunities as they grow and improve to to earn more money as well. If we have a shop with three technicians, we take that number of hours for each technician. It's added together. That is now the sold hours bonus goal for my advisor. So it, it ties it together. So the tech understands how many hours they need to produce to be rewarded. And it's the same number that the advisors need to sell in order for them to be rewarded. It's a perfect match. It's one-to-one. There's I mean, there's a push and pull from the front and the back that we try to set our pay plans up for, but um, our back pay plans are set on an hourly with incentive for production. I believe that pure flat rate is, is dead really fast with these upcoming cars and everything. And so our hourly with an incentive, on top of that for production. Um, but yes, our, our pay plans are a push and pull from the advisor to the front. And so we want our, our service riser be pushing sales. We want our technicians to be pushing proper inspections. We look at average repair order written by the techs. That number tells me whether a tech is slacking on their inspections. Cause if I have a service writer that sells 40%, which in my shop is what we're looking for, for a writer, and our tech is only writing up $1,000 a ticket, our ARO is going to drop. We average about twenty six to $3,100 average written per ticket. Our service writer sells 40% of that. That keeps our $1,000 to $1,200 ARO in my shop. So we know where our numbers need to be. We know where our sales need to be. So if I see a sales number drop, I'm not immediately going to the salesman with their pay plans and you, you screwed up. I'm looking at, is it my technician's not giving them the right opportunity? And we hold them both accountable to that with their pay plans. Yeah, Brian, you got a perspective on that? I hold probably a slightly different view. You know, I saw the the, the flat rate is dead, and I, I see that a lot from people. I, I believe flat rate with bad culture is dead. Um, I believe flat rate with good culture and incentives to get it done. I believe it's alive and well. And that is as long as you can predict, and you're. And, and I guess one of the things I should back up a hair before I say that and just talk about how you delegate work and how you systematize the workflow in itself if you're going to run a flat rate shop. Because I, I can't tell you how many times 
I, I'll hear people talk about how terrible flat rate is. And again, I, I see that undercurrent here. And I, I, I would say it's extremely terrible when you treat it as a stick and a carrot. When you when you emphasize back flags, when you overemphasize back flags, and and there is no push to get things through and still sold and done in that regard, yeah, it's a it's a dead animal. Um, but if you have the right culture around it, you have work delegated in a way that's appropriate. You sell inspections correctly, you sell diagnostic correctly, and you sell repair it correctly. There really isn't an issue there. You're a flat rate shop. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think the to be a flat rate shop, you have to sell it correctly. We're not going to stick and carry you and tell you, hey, you're getting back flagged when X happens. And as an owner and as managers, you also have to understand that every guy can have things go wrong. And when they do, you have to have a metric in place to take care of those things. Do they cost the business money? Yes. But at the end of the day, do they win for the employee and ultimately win for the business? Yes, they do. You're making flat rate work for you. It's culture around it. There is no bad system unless you manage a system improperly or you have a negative culture that won't enforce the things that you need to have happen. And I think that's a critical, when you talk about incentivized pay plans, the culture in front of it is more important than the plan. As long as the plan is a win-win for both, it can't just be business-focused incentivized pay plan. Oh, the business wins no matter what. Um, there has to be give and take on both sides. You have to create a win-win. And, and I think that if there's anything you take away from it, that's got to be one of the biggest. If it wins for the employee and it wins for the business and you can measure that, ASC, what has ASC done for my business? Well, I've got all of my techs are you know, at least master techs. I'm paying them an incentive as Bill was discussing to get themselves there. What's the benefit on the business? It's huge. Can you put a number to that, Bill? A non-defective part comeback, a you know, a, a QC, a quality issue from job done right. And if you're in, in a tolerance level, maybe the re, you know the outcome is that the everyone's ASE master tech. When we evaluate comebacks, it has less to do with their credential or their experience. It has more to do with their attitude. It's the guy with the poor attitude. And that's what you got to figure out. You got to figure out what created the poor attitude because it's the tech with the bad attitude that's having the issues with his work. And that's where you're seeing the work come back and having to be redone. And it's about attitude. So, you know, now we're right back to culture, right? Because I can't, I can't correct that with a pay plan. The pay plan will reward the performance of what I want them to achieve and what the company needs. But I can't fix their bad attitude with a pay plan. No matter, here's the thing, and I'm sure everybody's seen this. You have the you have the employee that comes and says, Hey, you know, it it's really tough and I need some more money. And you know, I haven't had a raise in a long time. And then somebody says, Well, yeah, maybe we should give them a raise. And so because they asked for a raise, they get a raise. Does that fix their attitude for a, just a little while? probably makes it worse in the long run more money more money will never fix those problems brian you did two thumbs up to bill lit a fire under you brian yeah well and i I say this constantly when you talk about attitude that is the biggest indicator of performance and comebacks and you know and when we try to motivate through a pay plan or through dollars i mean all we're really doing at that point is manipulation and, and we're not doing a good manipulation, we're doing a bad manipulation. We, we are trying to force them to do something that they don't want to do purely by dollars. And again, I, I just say it again, it's that it's hanging that carrot out there. You know, we're gonna throw a carrot out there and hope they chase it. And guess what, they chase it for a week or a month or a couple months, and then they're back knocking at your door again. Hey, I'm ready for that next raise because that's what you gave me last time I was in a bad mood. We as owners have to recognize the person and, you know, you hate to say this, but you, you go back into that culture again. If your business culture accepts that, it will continue. And if, you're, if your business culture does not accept that, it will eradicate itself. And, and those are the things that you, you have to be focused on when you get bad attitudes or you have to find what the core of the bad attitude is. And is it, you know, what's it related to? But at the end of the day, that causes more problem than anything else I can think of in a shop. 
the money is only part of it. You got to build your stuff around it. But that's where I was talking about. You have a pot of money to do so much. I have a CEO yeah. of my company that is running, going to run the third shop and that uh, runs the other two shops. So I don't do a whole lot anymore. Uh, cause he's day to day of, of both my operations right now, but his big thing. And from knowing him, he wants to drive a nice car. So he gets a $399 a month car allowance to lease buy whatever nice car he wants along with an expense account of so many dollars per year for maintenance and repairs at retail rates in the company. And that is more important to him than way more money. And you know, those are the things you, you need to look at being, he's a full executive. You can have a different executive compensation in my state. So it meets all the rules and laws and regulations that are set forth by the great state of Minnesota. Um, and so we can do anything we need in, on that front, but there are so many different ways to, to help employees and you got to know what they want. And this is why I rely on our culture and I rely on my leaders and my team because we have multiple shops and multiple organizations. I cannot physically connect and touch every single one of my employees on a regular enough basis to know what they want and what they need. And this is why we train our leaders within our organization to make sure that they're constantly touching their employees in, in proper ways can I, to so find out what they you, want. To give our listeners something that uh, they take away, is there a tool that you use to find the motivators for your employees? Yeah. Yeah. We use, I mean, we use a, a form when they're hired on that's get to know you. And then we use what we call a, a different, we don't do yearly reviews, quarterly reviews. We do ongoing coaching. So during our coaching sessions, our managers are constantly finding out. We had one employee that was always asking for raises always asking for raises and he was making good money. And we found out that it wasn't money. He had a management issue with money, which we know a lot of employees do. And so it was mutually beneficial to him and the company. And we found out, he goes, I just don't know how to manage my money. He finally came on and said it. And so what was mutually beneficial to the company and the employee is, how about if we pay for a financial advisor and some financial classes for you? He's like, that's awesome. And he's been fine since it, it wasn't necessarily a money issue, but money fixed his temporary problems. Was it Dave Ramsey? We use Dave Ramsey for that one. Yes. That's, that's awesome. Well, I, I, I just, I wanted to add one piece to that, which is I keep this sheet on my desk at all times. You know, it's 23 motivators of people. And, and the question becomes what motivates each employee. And you can use, you can, you can solicit that information through worksheets. You can solicit it directly. And by worksheets, I mean, you could use disc tests, you can use personality tests, all of those things to find them. But I think the, the piece here that I'm taking away from what you said, Seth, is that all of us owners should know that. All of our managers should know that. And we should have a way to drive that bus to what motivates our employees. I think most companies have too big an organization, even in independent garages, to make sure that they're constantly... At one, I'm a big believer in only... One exceptional manager can manage three to five people. One good manager can manage two to three people under them. So we try to set up pods within our organization that we really have managers that know their people under them. I would add this to that. I think a failure of a lot of owners and leaders is they fail to listen. If you would just listen, it's easy to know what your people need. And your job is to make sure they get it. If you started every day just by saying, today I'm going to listen. I'm going to listen to what my people are telling me. I'm going to learn what it is they want, what it is they want in their job, what it is they want in life. You just have to listen and you'll find out. Then make sure they get it. I love your concept and idea, Bill. Uh, by the way, Bill Hill says with all the different personalities, there's no one pay plan, just the basics. Then we work what's uh, unimportant to him. I think one of the biggest takeaways here is creativity in need. What can we do to solve our problems? There was a comment from Mike Nicholson. So how are you guys setting diagnostics in this pay plan? Sounds like a situation where a drivability guy will still lose. Your thoughts on that? In my shop, one guy does all the diagnosis. At his point, everything's done on a pre-sale. Um, that pre-sale goes in, you know, we, we assume every job at two hours. Um, if it takes less, we will credit back, but it's got to be significantly less. If it takes more, once he's at, we're going to say 75% of where he should be, if it's actually going to take that long in the two-hour spectrum, 
he's up at the advisor saying, it's time to get more time. And if you keep that sales plan and, and you're, you're on top of it, and at the end of the day, you really want a two for one. I mean, that's, that's just what it boils down to when it comes to diagnosis, but it's not always possible. You know, it depends on how far you're going to get into it. And if you upfront sell it and you continue to let that customer know, here's where we are, here's what we need, and then you bring it back to your technician, that's how you prevent the loss. But you have to be full disclosure with that, with that customer before you even start. I'm a big proponent of making sure you get paid for diagnostic because if you don't, it's a loss for everyone. And it's a big loss. We charge for diagnosis quite heavily, but uh, Michael, to answer your question directly, our ATEX, our diagnostic techs, they are paid at a higher hourly guarantee and a higher flat rate. So if they do 40 hours, a tech that's not doing diagnostic has to do 50 or 55 to make the same money on our incentive pay plan. And to take it a step further, our shop foremen who do our real heavy intermittent drivability and our real heavy diagnostic, they are paid on a straight salary. And then they have bonuses on complete shop production. They are also the dispatch members in our shop. So to answer your question, in my organization, we understand that diag techs a lot of times get the short end of the stick and we prevent that. So I'll take a stab at that because I think it's important. I think both the guys have made really good points. When it comes into our payroll program, like I said before, we're going to set a goal of the number of hours that that tech has to produce. And that's going to be based on their experience, their knowledge, and their skill sets. So our diagnostic tech, that's a consideration in setting that hours goal. But again, I'm going to go back to what I said earlier. You also have to have all the measurables in place. So we also are looking at tech product tech, uh, production by each individual tech. And we are monitoring and have goals set for calculated labor sales versus actual labor sales. And we have a goal for what that needs to be. And we're looking at gross wages paid versus uh actual labor sales. So we actually see on every pay period, the gross profit for that individual. When you do those things, you will be charging enough to be able to pay your diagnostic tech enough. And you stay out of that system where the diagnostic tech feels like he's beat, get, getting beat up all the time that he can't make enough money. It's really hard when you take the guy who's got the really high skill level and put him in a service bay next to a guy that does ball joints and breaks and goes, man, that guy's killing it over there. Well, that's what you always fight. That's the constant. And our our, our, ATEC, our ATECs know that the BTECs, we flat out tell them the BTECs have to produce way more based on the two people. Absolutely. Plans. And we See, tell them. Here's the beauty of that. When you start to have your weekly shop meetings and you start to share the numbers, everybody knows what everybody's numbers are. So when we use a whiteboard at the shop meeting, when we have our lunch meeting at Wednesday and we bring the whiteboard up, if there's five technicians, there's five names and there's an hours goal for that tech and then there's their actual hours. Everybody knows it. And it also helps people understand that somebody else is struggling. Let me help them. Because you talked a lot about metrics and how you get to that number. And you know, one thing I would say, and, and I think it's easy for sometimes us as owners to make this mistake, overcomplicate it for the employee. And I think it's critical that you keep it simple on their end. Now that doesn't mean it's simple on yours to figure out how it fits in that gross profit percentage, but it is so critical that you don't give them the same form. If you're using 18 different metrics to figure it out, you're always welcome to show that to them because yeah. there's no reason they shouldn't know it. But if they have to look at that to figure it out, it is a recipe for disaster. And right. the more simple you keep it, the better it works because everybody knows and there's no trust barrier that gets broken. If That's they right. have to go back and use an 18 layer, you know, 18 layers to get to that number, all of a sudden they don't trust you anymore. Well, why does it take, why is it so hard to figure that out? Um, yeah. It doesn't mean that you as an owner shouldn't self check it that way and understand it. But when it gets to the employee side, it should be basic addition or basic multiplication. That's it. End of story. And otherwise, they'll just get lost. Well, you're right. And, and the point is, when you do these things, it's supported by the math. All of this is nothing but a big math problem. <laughs> and when it's supported by the math, that's so different than the tech says, well, where did that number come from? And I go, I don't know. It just seemed like a good number that day. So that's your number. 
Well, Bill, no. Bill, that's you got to understand. That's the Common Core math now versus real math. When I have to understand, my kids are learning. I, I, I question whether I even understand math after trying to help my kids with this distance learning homework. That's harder for me because my son is a math teacher in early college high school. So, hey guys, uh, wow! I I really do believe that if I didn't stop and we just kept going on, we could talk about this for another two hours. And the chatter on the social media has been off the charts. So I want to thank everybody for that. It may be beneficial that I we come back and do some kind of part two in the future, you know, and and see what else we can come up with. A lot of great ideas. Uh, I don't think there's any one answer. I think it's it it's shop dependent. It's profit dependent it's it's hourly it's incentive it but you know what i think we threw an awful lot of great stuff out to motivate people to do something about it i mean that's what we do here on 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 the town hall academy we throw a lot of great ideas i'd love for you to all you know give us a final perspective or word on, on everything that you've heard or at least maybe even restate your passion so uh brian i'll, I'll start with you i'll go to seth next and then bill how about that you know, the way I would phrase this is I think it's important that as owners, we look at a plan, we understand our business, we understand our culture, and from that, we build the pay plan. And quite honestly, if your culture will support the plan that you use, I, I'm not going to say that there's a bad plan out there, as long as it works out in a win-win for the employee and the business. But, it, but I think it is extremely critical that you understand the elements of your business, you understand your KPIs, and you understand how those work within your employees to get there. And I also think, you know, one of the things we didn't mention here, but I'm going to close with it. It's incredibly important to understand where teamwork and independent working fit in to the entire plan. And we have to look at everything in a full team perspective, but individuals have to perform to get it there. So you need to make sure that balance exists and you need to understand what that balance looks like. I'm a component of the team. And sometimes we incentivize to the individual to get a team outcome. But you have to understand where that balance is and how you achieve it. And we didn't get into that, but I think that's just one more component of this. And there's my two cents. He just bought into part two right there. <laughs> <laughs> Ryan Kelly, Valley Auto Electric, Covington, Washington, uh, Chairman, ASA Northwest. Thanks for being here, Brian. Seth, how about you, man? I'll, I'll tie it in the Brian stuff too. I, I agree. I mean, we, our pay plans, you need to build it for your business, but you need to build it for the employee, but you have to understand what the employees wants and needs and criteria is. And that's a moving target. That's why we go ongoing coaching. It changes. It'll change a year later. The employee will be a different person. He has a family, he has a kid. He wants something different. That target moves. Um, and I'll, leave it with the last thing about, I, I truly believe in a team pay plan. We build 70 to 80% of their compensation on individual and the other 20 to 30% on the team goal. And some of our team goals are even company outings or all sorts of other fun cultural things, but you have to tie it back together or it's one, there's no I in team unless you put it between the E as people argue, but doesn't fit. I think it would be a blast working for either Brian or Seth, uh, you know, just because there's so much going on and, and the cultures are so strong. Thank you, Seth Thorson, EuroTech Auto Service, New Brighton, Minnesota, and LMV Bavarian. You got it. <laughs> Did you see how purposeful I had to move my mouth to get that out? <laughs> BMW Tech Support Company. Thank you so much, Seth. Uh, Bill, I'll give you the last word. The best pay plans work for the best employees. Make sure that you have the right people there that bring the right talent to your team, because team is critically important. Reward them for their performance. Everybody wins. Well, that was perfect. Thank you. That was, uh, wow, very profound. Thank you. Bill Haas. Haas Performance Consulting uh, and Business Manager at NACAT. Thanks, guys. Enjoy your weekend. Let's repurpose this. Let's watch this on Facebook. The podcast and the video will release, repurpose next Thursday. Guys, thanks again. Everybody have a great thanks, weekend. Sir. Thanks for being on board to listen and learn from the premier automotive aftermarket podcast. Until next time. <laughs> <laughs>